Okay, thank you. And everyone, welcome to today's webinar. We are gonna get started in just uh, less than a minute. We're gonna start recording and welcome. Thanks everybody for putting where you're calling in from into the chat box. Hi everyone, my name is Lori Peak, and I serve as the director of the Natural Hazard Center at the University of Colorado Boulder. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the monthly Making Mitigation Work webinar series, which is hosted by the Natural Hazard Center and made possible with the support of the Federal Emergency Management Agency and the National Science Foundation. This webinar series highlights recent progress in mitigation policy, practice, and research. Thank you for joining this webinar session, which will feature Casey Zuzak, who has worked at FEMA since 2011, and most recently served as a lead for the National Risk Index, which you will hear more about during today's webinar. Thank you so much to all of our participants for being here and for the work that you are doing to reduce the harm and suffering from disasters. A few announcements before we begin the formal webinar presentation. This forum is being recorded. The captioned video recording and presentation slides from today's webinar will be posted online at the Natural Hazard Center website, hazards.colorado.edu. This is also where you can find the recordings and supplemental materials from prior Making Mitigation Work webinars, as well as access to many other free resources. Thanks to a partnership with the International Association of Emergency Managers, we can offer one contact hour of emergency management training through the IAEM certification program. To receive the credit, you are required to attend the entire webinar session today, but I promise you're going to want to stay the whole time. Please visit the Making Mitigation Work webpage under the Trainings tab at hazards.colorado.edu for more information. You can contact Katie Murphy at hasctr at colorado.edu for more information on receiving your certificate for attending this webinar today. And Katie will drop the link to the continuing education credits and also to her email in the chat. If at any point during the presentation today, you have questions or comments, you can offer those either via the chat function or in the Q&A box on Zoom. We will monitor the questions in both places, so no need to put them in both places, um, but just know that we will be watching out for questions and that Casey has promised us he's gonna set aside some time at the end to make sure and be able to respond to your inquiries. For those questions we are unable to get to today during our short one hour together, we will share written responses from Casey via the Making Mitigation Work webinar page. Now, without further ado, I am so pleased to introduce today's speaker, Casey Zuzak. Casey is a senior risk analyst for HAZUS and the Natural Hazards Risk Assessment Program in the Risk Management Directorate at the Federal Emergency Management Agency. Uh, Casey has actually worked in FEMA Region 4, FEMA Region 8, and most recently at headquarters. And so he has been a longtime uh, FEMA employee. He has a master's in geography from the University of South Carolina, and he served as the lead for the National Risk Index, which you're going to hear about today. Um, you're going to also have an opportunity to learn more about how he and his team put both their geographical as well as analytical skills to good use in building this important national index. Casey, we are honored to have you with us here today. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and turn the slide controls over to you. As I do that, I hope everybody will give uh, Casey a warm welcome in the chat box. Thank you.
Thank you for the great introduction, Lori. And um, you could just give me a quick um, okay that you can see my screen that I'm sharing everything. Absolutely, the screen looks great and you're coming through just fine with your sound, so thank you. Great, thank you. And, and good morning and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Casey Zuzak and I'm FEMA, a senior risk analyst within the risk management directorate at FEMA and lead for the National Risk Index. Um, today, I'm going to talk about the National Risk Index, how we developed the, the product, and some of the different uses around how to, how to leverage the National Risk Index to support um, your program and you know, different, different aspects of understanding differences in natural hazard risk across the country. Before I jump in, into the National Risk Index itself, I did want to talk a little bit about our program or the Natural Hazards Risk Assessment Program, which is encompassing of both HAZIS, FEMA's, FEMA's loss, economic loss software, as well as the National Risk Index. Our team is a small team at FEMA headquarters, and we, we take natural hazards risk information and operationalize it into technical information to support actions that allows users to take actions to reduce disaster suffering. The NHRAP provides com a common understanding and a baseline understanding of hazards and consequence data in a, to support the reduction of disaster suffering overall. We, we operate under three different goals around institutionalizing innovation, leveraging partnerships uh, with hazard identification experts, both inside and outside of FEMA, and empowering state, local, tribal, and territorial governments to reduce disaster risk through data to create a more resilient nation. We, we also support FEMA's risk map program or the floodplain mapping program within FEMA, and we serve as the A or the assessment in the risk map acronym. Um, we also, and we do this by taking hazard information that's provided by the mapping program and understand what are the potential impacts of, of the different events and to help communicate and plan for the different hazard or the flood hazard and to mitigate risks associated with um, flooding. So the National Risk Index is, is one of our two, two products that we produce out of the NHRAP or the Natural Hazards Risk Assessment Program. Um, the understanding risk is, is not something new and communicating it is, has always been a challenge. So the National Risk Index began as a way for us to start talking about how we can uh, reduce costs of inconsistent or duplicative risk assessments to, and mitigation planning and other planning efforts across the agency. The National Risk Index helps us to quickly identify areas that may have a high return on investment for mitigation projects, either in mitigation planning or mitigation grants. It also allows for us to reduce the duplicative costs um, of risk assessments and allows community planners to then focus on identifying potential mitigation actions. The National Risk Index provides a pre-calculated top-down approach to creating a baseline risk assessment. All of the data and results of the National Risk Index are free. It provides a, you know, it's consistent across the United States and a comprehensive database of multi-hazard and multi-peril risk assessment inclusive of social vulnerability and community resilience. Prior to the National Risk Index, nothing of this scope uh, really existed um, in, in the community. Often you may see a multi-hazard risk assessment for one, one part of the United States or one hazard across the country. But the NRI, we had the ability to bring together 18 different natural hazards um, to create a risk index across the country. Um, you know, it, it also allows FEMA to, to have conversations with communities and communities to engage in conversations. Within the risk map program, we have a lot of community meetings that we work with um, local emergency management officials and community leaders on how to reduce their flood risk. The conversation doesn't stop at flood risks. Communities wanna talk about the other hazards that are impactful to their jurisdiction. On the West Coast, they wanna talk about earthquakes. In the Southeast, they wanna understand more about how they can buy down their risk around hurricanes. The National Risk Index allows FEMA to start having these conversations and have effective dialogues. It also allows for us to bring in social equity components 
um, into the conversation as well. The National Risk Index actually began back in 2008 as a, what we call it a vulnerability index or a way to understand and prioritize flood mitigation projects in FEMA Region 8. It was very flood centric and um, worked really well for helping to identify and prioritize flood mitigation projects. Um, by 2016, the data became pretty out of date with updates to the census and also I want to explore into other hazards outside of just flood. So we began you know, engaging different subject matter experts about how can we develop and expand the National Risk Index. And throughout uh, 2018 and 19, we reviewed the data, put together some mock-ups of potential applications, and um, really began updating and creating the data. In 2020, uh, we released the phase one application in November. And this summer, we will be rolling out our full application of the National Risk Index. Uh, within the application, we'll be doing, we have some data updates planned as well as some uh, usability and or the ability to, you know, explore the data a lot more and really get into understanding more about what's driving risk across the country. To develop something like the National Risk Index, it's important to bring together all different sectors of government from local, state, and regional partners, our other federal agency partners like the USGS and NOAA, academia, as well as uh, private industry and nonprofits. We wanted to develop something in the National Risk Index that was able to be used by the community and not just within a silo of FEMA. This is just a few of the partners we worked with. We worked with um, a lot of the FEMA contracting partners at CDM Smith, ABS Group, um, Atkins, uh, Nodi Solutions, Factor, um, our partners at the USGS, um, US Forest Service and NOAA. We worked with the University of South Carolina, Central Florida, Arizona State, CU Boulder, um, and a, a whole, whole bunch of organizations and upwards of 80 SMEs throughout the process. So thank you to everyone who supported the National Risk Index in our development. To bring all of this information together, we really wanted to look at three different or three different working ideas. One, so we, like every other federal projects, we created a work group. So we had a work group that was focused around natural hazards. This work group helped us understand what is the best available data and how do we bring that together to create a, a product that is able to communicate risk to natural hazards. Early on, we also had a social vulnerability and community resilience working group, or understand what is the best social equity data out there and how do we incorporate it into the National Risk Index? Do we just focus on vulnerabilities? Do we focus on resilience? And what, what indices and how do we wanna bring those into the NRI um, was what we charged that working group with. And we had a third working group which focused on data processing and visualization. Having all of the data are great, but how do we bring it into one cohesive product? And how do we bring it into a product that allows anyone to understand their risk to natural hazards was important as well. So the first piece was identifying the hazards that went into the National Risk Index. I reviewed the 50 available state mitigation plans at the time to do a quick frequency analysis to understand which hazards were most impactful to communities and to the states and which hazards were they most interested in mitigating in the long term. Um, if the hazard was included in at least 50% or 25 of the 50 state mitigation plans, we included it. We also included hazards that were a regional significant event or a hazard that would be impactful across the country or to a large region of the US. Um, so hazards like tsunami, volcano, and hurricanes were included as a regional significant event and that's how we ultimately came up with the 18 different natural hazards. We leveraged data from our partner agencies. Um, all data incorporated into the National Risk Index are publicly available and nationally available with a, a few minor exceptions. Um, and we also wanted to focus on natural hazards uh, because most of those data are not uh, protected or you know, harder to get or, and really we wanted to keep everything as publicly as available as possible. So these are the 18 hazards we ultimate, ultimately landed on. Um, you know, as, as we move through future versions of the NRI, um, we're hoping to add more hazards over time, uh, but this was really the base and the solid foundation of the NRI. 
So we included hazards from avalanche to wildfire, lightning to strong wind, cold wave to winter weather, um, and every, everything in between. Our second working group, the Social Vulnerability and Community Resilience Working Group, um, we charged them with two different aspects. One is understanding which aspects of social, vulner social vulnerability and community resilience um, need to be brought into a risk index. Um, and with that, the, the working group quickly coalesced around, we need to include both. Social vulnerability helps us understand potential disproportionate impacts of a disaster where community resilience, as we define it, helps us understand which communities need support recovering from a disaster or are able to recover from a disaster without outside support. So that was the first thing. So we included both uh, because they really measure two different aspects. Um, and second, it was, does FEMA wanna create our own indices to support this or do we wanna leverage other products out there? Um, and we all agreed that we want to leverage something that's already existing and not create our own product at FEMA. Um, and for this, we reviewed all of the different social vulnerability and resilience indicators out there that took a top-down approach that were nationally and consistently available. And the working group ultimately recommended that we move forward with the Social Vulnerability Index from the University of South Carolina's Hazards and Vulnerability Research Institute as the SOBI component or as the Social Vulnerability component and it's complementary BRIC or baseline resilience indicators for communities indexed to serve as the resiliency component for the NRI. There's a lot of different ways to define risk. The way we define risk in the National Risk Index is um, that we define risk as the product of the expected annual loss, social vulnerability, and the inverse of community resilience, where the expected annual loss is the natural hazard exposure, the hazard frequency, and the historic loss ratio. This allows us to really dive deep into each of the 18 different natural hazards. Um, so breaking it down a little bit further, the frequency allows us to understand the rate of occurrence or how likely a hazard is able to occur in an area. For exposure, this tells us what's in the way of the hazard. So how many people, what is the property value and agriculture value exposed? We define exposure for each of the three individual components. So property value or building value, people in terms of fatalities and agriculture, which looks at both livestock and crop impacts. And a historic loss ratio, which helps us understand how bad have historic losses been in that area. Are we able to derive it from either local or neighboring counties? Do we need to leverage a national average um, to really come up with the historic loss ratios for property value, people and fatalities, and then agriculture as well? So I wanna look at each of these factors individually. So first is the frequency or you know, how often does the hazard occur? Um, this tells us you know, if we have 22,000 lightning strike or 2200 lightning strikes in a year, and we have 22 years in the period of record, we average 100 lightning strikes per year. Um, we measure this ideally for probabilistic probability, um, but that data are not always available. So sometimes we have to do a frequency um, and you know, take the number of events divided by the number of years to come up with a, the probability of the, the event. Um, sometimes we look at the number of events per year. Sometimes we look at the number of days an event occurs per year, like heat wave. Um, for hazards like flooding and wildfire, we look at the probability of, a, of the event occurring over time. For the exposure component, uh, like I said, we measure it for three different ways. And we, the goal of this is to really understand the susceptible area, the susceptible zone to a hazard. Um, and we use uh, land cover land use data to break down census blocks to understand you know, where people live, where people don't live, where we have agricultural lands, where we have riparian areas, so that we're only measuring impacts where we have exposure. So we use the HAZIS database to understand population and building value across the census blocks in the United States, and then the census of agriculture to understand both crop and livestock impacts. And like I said, we for each of the 18 different hazards, we measure the susceptible zones, Sometimes that may be a long 
um, a flooding, a flood zone. Sometimes it may be the entire census block is exposed to the hazard for like a tornado or a hail event. And then the third piece we look at is a historic loss ratio, or what is the average percentage of loss of occurrence for each of the hazard types? So is it something that we have, and we use Shieldis as our base data set to come up with the historic loss information. So this allows for us to understand where and what historic hazards have looked like. And we leverage Bayesian credibility theory to expand uh, the county level data. This allows for us to understand, you know, if we may not have loss information for one area, but we know we have frequency, we know we have exposure, what would the historic losses be like in that community? And we look at that for four different geographies. So we take a national average, a regional average, a county average, or a non-geographic area, so a, a grid cell. To bring all of this data together, uh, which is a large amount of information, and we look at it, like I said, from the three different pieces for the expected annual loss. Um, we leverage the hazards frequency um, to create a expected annual loss for buildings, for people, and for agriculture. And we sum those together um, to come up with a, a expected annual loss or an EAL score um, for the hazard. So that gives us an expected annual dollar loss um, for each hazard across the country. And a couple of things to note for the drought hazard, we only calculate the expected annual loss for agriculture. And we only calculate all three components for um, hail, strong wind, cold wave, and riverine flooding. Uh, when we roll out the full national risk index, we actually are expanding it um, to include hazards that have had more than $10 million in expected annual loss for agriculture versus uh, greater than 5% of the historic annual loss. So one question we've, we've or one way we've done it or calculate the expected annual loss is around fatalities. Um, we, this is something that was incredibly important to the project team as, as we were getting into the data, we realized that some hazards losses and impacts are driven primarily by fatalities not just property damage or agriculture damage impacts. Um, so to do this, we leveraged the benefit cost standards from FEMA, which uses the, a product from the Federal Aviation Administration to define um, the value of a statistical life, uh, which is in 2019 dollars, it is $7.4 million per life. So that's why you see us adding um, next to the expected annual loss for fatalities, um, the $7.4 million and where, where that value comes from. And, and the reason it's important is hazards like heat and avalanche, um, that drives a large amount of the impacts. Um, and same thing for agriculture for drought and wildfire, a large number of the, the impacts for those hazards uh, really come from not property damage. So when we look at this combined, we, we see hazards like heat, which have you know, only $49 million in historic loss around that from 1996 to 2016 in this example, um, only account for roughly $50 million in, in property damage. But once you look at monetized fatalities, that $50 million goes up to $34 billion. So fatalities in heat and cold wave really ex show a lot of the, the reasons why we need to look also not just at building damages, but it impacts the people and it impacts the crops once we look at drought as well. So this is again, just another summation. We do have the one hazard frequency and we apply that hazard frequency to each of the three components. Um, and like I said, we measure the agricultural impacts just for those five hazards and we're expanding that circle in the, in the Venn diagram to include um, a bunch more hazards um, when we release the full national risk index uh, this summer. I did want to take a second before we took a, take a look at the scores and ratings um, to talk a little bit about what this means. Um, within the national risk index, we provide relative risk scores. 
uh, for the, the NRI score or the risk score. And it's based on the expected annual loss from a natural hazard, as well as understanding how social vulnerability and community resilience either impact or increase or decrease the impact of a natural hazard. We also calculate separate rating, scores and ratings so that users are able to actually see what a community's expected annual losses from a visual standpoint across the country, as well as in text uh, in a pop-up and users are also able in the full application to create a report. Uh, so that can be an input into any type of application or, you know, um, or plans. And finally, the scores and ratings um, can be viewed for all of the 18 different, in our, our current application for the composite uh, risk score or what happens when we add everything together or the composite expected annual loss score or the sum of all 18 hazards. In our full application that's coming out this summer, users will be able to visualize that for all 18 hazards um, for both the community resilient or the community risk score and the expected annual loss score. The community score really describes its relative position amongst others. So just because a, com a community is rated as very high versus uh, relatively high, that difference um, is, is driven by geographic or by breaks. And we use a, a K-means clustering to come up with our, our different breaks. Um, so it's really important to understand that it is a relative ranking um, and that, you, you know, upwards or downwards movement can happen. And that it's really important that the National Risk Index is used as a way to start having conversations around reducing risk to natural hazards. Um, there's also a, a quantitative or a qualitative ranking that's associated um, that allows users to understand if they do have a very high or very low risk to natural hazards. And throughout the um, NRI, darker blue represents a lower risk where uh, darker red is, is a very high risk. Um, so this is a snapshot of the National Risk Index from, from a high level. It allows us to quickly see across the country where, where we have differences in natural hazard risk. And this is for all of the 18 hazards combined. In the left-hand column, we have the expected annual loss ranking or where we have the highest um, annualized dollar losses for natural hazards. On the right-hand side, we have the NRI rating or what happens when we bring in social vulnerability and community resilience. Does that increase or decrease a community's risk to the natural hazards? We also produce the data at two different levels of geography. We do that for the county level and the census tract. Um, census tract is really just the lowest level of geography that we're able to produce it based upon the social vulnerability and community resilience uh, rate, ratings, as well as some of the hazard data. We are only able to bring the expected annual loss data in at the, the census tract level. Um, but we do as many calculations at the block level and aggregate um, higher as, as possible. So with the National Risk Index, um, we have a variety of stakeholders. Um, it can be used to help inform long-term community recovery. It can be used to encourage community risk level risk engagement. So talking to communities about how to mitigate different hazards or having the conversation about which hazards to mitigate. It can be used to enhance community mitigation plans and educate homeowners about risks uh, to different hazards. Um, when I look, relocated to Colorado, I had no idea that there was such a large hail risk here. And within a few years of living in Colorado, I made multiple insurance claims on a roof and on a car um, from, from hail damage. And, you know, I, I have a, a, I'm a hazard nerd. I love understanding about natural hazards. So I knew we had a higher hail risk. So I made sure our, our deductibles were set that way, where someone who may have no idea about um, the risk to natural hazards when they locate to an area. This can be a tool to help educate homeowners. Um, through FEMA's Building Code Save study, we found that um, higher codes and standards reduce long-term disaster impacts. And the National Risk Index can also be used to understand which communities have high risk to natural hazards and may have low codes 
and understand where we can prioritize different outreach efforts. Um, so the National Risk Index can really be used to help improve risk assessment and incentivize mitigation action across the country. Also, the NRI helps FEMA really achieve some of our uh, strategic, advance our strategic goals. The transformative work of the NRI allows FEMA to really begin building a culture of preparedness and reducing the complexity of the, of the agency by having one uh, piece of music or one, one sheet to talk off of. Um, data from the National Risk Index is being integrated into FEMA programs, within the FEMA programs. Uh, FEMA's Resilience Analysis and Preparedness Tool or the RAPT tool uh, leverages National Risk Index data to help users understand where they have impacts to hazards and then what they can do to mitigate those hazards by understanding what infrastructure is exposed um, to the different hazard areas. Um, it's also being leveraged to develop community profiles across the country so, so users then understand more about their work and hazards that impact their communities as well. And the NRI is really a conversation starter. Um, just because a community has a tornado risk, they may not be aware of what their risks to tornadoes are, but it allows those communities to have conversations about how they can either reduce risk or if they want to engage in risk reduction strategies or if they want to focus um, on a different hazard. Uh, so just by having the NRI as a starting point, it's a huge advantage for a large number of communities and communities that may not have the same level of funding as another. Um, so within the within FEMA, we have we've talked to a few different programs about how they can use the, the National Risk Index. And the mitigation planning program is one. Um, does this solve every every um, you know need within the mitigation program? I wish it did, but unfortunately it doesn't. But it really allows communities to have a baseline hazard risk assessment to build off of. Um, so by having this it allows community planners to really focus on some of the initial stages of understanding where and which communities and what infrastructure may be exposed to different hazard data sets to help build re resilience and help identify um, areas of highest risk. It can also be used in the, when drafting a plan, uh, the NRI can help communities meet requirements by providing efficient standardized, standardized risk assessment methodology and also allow communities to really understand and what the potential is to mitigate natural hazards and through identification of uh, mitigation actions. The National Risk Index can also be used to support the hazard mitigation grant um, process by understanding you know, which hazards are impactful to a community and it can support understanding you know, if you have two projects um, which one may have a higher return on investment by just quickly understanding where we have differential impacts and, and hazards. Um, we provide expected annual loss dollar frequency and probability of the hazard, which is dependent on the specific hazard itself, and what populations are exposed to the different hazards in the community. All of the data are available from the National Risk Index, and it's all downloadable in either tabular and CSV format spatial um, GIS services, shapefiles, and we are adding um, bio geo databases for, for Esri users as well. So we we're putting the information out there in a way that can be consumed uh, by anyone. And one other application is around the risk communication pieces. Um, communicating risk is, can be challenging but the National Risk Index allows for us to start having the conversations. It can help bridge the gap between awareness to mitigation action. Uh, the NRI can be used to help identify areas where additional communication can be leveraged and targeted messaging. By providing data, um, it allows users to make risk-informed decisions. So in summer of this year, we will be rolling out our full application. And what that looks like is we'll be providing two main updates. One is around the application itself. Right now we are leveraging Esri ArcGIS online technology, and we're moving to a custom web application that we, we built for the National Risk Index. This allows users to visualize the 18 different hazard types 
um, and the expected annual loss and risk score layers all in one location. It also allows users to explore more information about their communities by having an enhanced web map interface. Users can click on any county or census tract across the country and there will be a pop up on the right hand side that allows you to explore the information as well as the ability to create a county community risk profile. And this allows users to either create a risk profile for one county or one census tract or multiple counties and multiple census tracts um, that a user would be interested in comparing. Um, all of it prints out in a nice PDF that can be insert, inserted into any type of report or applications. Um, we also are going to provide ISO compliant metadata files for any GIS user so that users can understand the data that they're looking at and how it relates to um, risk across the country and making sure that we're communicating everything on a um, compliant form format. And finally, within the application, we will be providing uh, a relational tribal data set. So this allows users to understand which counties and census tracts relate to the different tribes within the NRI leveraging data so that users who may not be able to leverage um, detailed GIS applications can easily still use the data uh, specifically for their tribal area. Um, so this spatial relationship is, is something that we're super excited to roll out. As for the data, we, I mentioned earlier that we are updating our agricultural losses to move from just the four hazards plus, uh, I guess, five hazards to include five additional hazards, heat wave, hurricane, tornado, wildfire, and the winter weather hazard types. Um, this allows us to provide a more robust expected annual loss value for those hazards. And those are all hazards. So then we'll be covering all hazards that are truly impacted by uh, the truly impact agriculture across the country. We're also updating our historic loss ratio. Um, right now we're looking at data from 1996 to 2016 in the app. And with the release of Shieldus version 19, we'll be incorporating years 2017, 18, and 19. That's incredibly important because we've had some large events um, like Hurricane Harvey, Hurricane Irma Zimaria, Hurricane Irma, um, Hurricane Matthew, and uh, Florence across the, the, the Southeast US. So we've had some large impact events. Same things for wildfire and the Paradise Fire in California that we'll be bringing into the National Risk Index so that we can help um, update our historic loss ratio. We're also making an update around our coastal flooding component. Um, right now, we, with the data that were available, uh, we were only able to create a nationwide average um, for one of our components within the fl coastal flooding component. But now we're actually creating that as a regional average. So we're looking at uh, different hazard frequencies from the Northwest versus the Northwest Pacific Northwest to the um, Southern California differences along the Gulf Coast versus the Atlantic Coast. So this is really going to refine the way we are calculating our, our coastal flood component. And we're working with NOAA and future releases to update that even further. Uh, our shortest period of record for a historical frequency is around the landslide data. Um, so adding three years worth of data um, gets a, a huge win for the landslide frequency database. So super excited for that. And then finally, we are revising our entire tornado expected annual loss calculations. Uh, for this, we are looking at, you know, instead of having one um, expected annual loss, we're looking at the three different severity types. So we're looking at uh, weak tornadoes or EF01, two versus two and three, and then four and five for the catastrophic tornadoes. And we're also adjusting how we're proportioning the uh, frequency from the county to the census tract data um, to bring it more in line with um, an expected annual loss for tornadoes. Um, and again, this will be rolling out in summer 2021. Um, and, uh, and we're getting pretty close to that. And feel free to reach out to us at FEMA-NRI at FEMA.DHS.gov and the email is up there in the top right uh, to be added to our mailing lists where we'll be you know, sending out updates as, as we're able to over time. So again, thank you everyone for um, your interest in the National Risk Index and you know, wanting to talk more about natural hazard risk and hazard risk across the country. 
as I mentioned, our current phase one application was released in November 2020. We were super excited about that. Uh, we've received a lot of positive feedback and attention about how we can, just by putting the data out there, help drive change across the country and help start the conversation about reducing risk across the net, across the nation. Um, you know, one thing that was our goal is that we are putting the data out there as well as our methodologies so that users could really understand what we were doing and how we were doing it. And that over time we can update and revise to make sure that we're staying um, with the best available science, the best available data in the National Risk Index. And this summer we are releasing our full application. Um, I, I wish I could give you a date, but you know, as of right now, it's still on schedule for this summer. And as we get closer to, to the release, um, I'm happy to provide any updates or share updates as well. And if you would like to be added to our, our mailing list, feel free to email us at fema-nri at fema.dhs.gov. And if you have any questions that we were not able to answer today, or as you're exploring the application, feel free to reach out to us as well. Um, I'm always, we're always happy to, to answer any questions or talk to users about how they can use the NRI. And finally, I realized I just never told anyone where to get it. Um, if you go to fema.gov slash NRI or National Risk Index, all is one word, uh, that will take you to our landing page. And from there, you can connect to our application. Um, we also provide a full technical documentation about how we've created and manipulated every piece of data and aspect of that within the National Risk Index and some information and insight into why we've, we've went down the path um, that we ultimately did. So um, that's available. I see there are a ton of questions in the Q&A um, and some, some more in the chat. So I'll go ahead and, and pause there and turn it over to Lori um, for the question and answers. Nice, Casey, thank you so much for that presentation. And you are right, the questions have been flowing in through the Q&A and the chat box. And, and thanks to your timing, we have about 15 minutes remaining. And so to everybody out there, please know that we're monitoring both the chat and the Q&A and all move sort of back and forth between the two. And so no need to re um, state your question in both platforms. We'll get as far as we can um, with the questions. And also please know um, if you put multiple questions in the chat or the q and I'll likely take your first one just so we can get through as many as possible. But as Casey said, he is so happy to follow up and we'll also post written responses to those questions we don't get to. Um, so without taking any more time, let's dive in. So Casey, I'm going to start first with a question from April. Um, she said, we recently mapped a supplemental flood zone because the special flood hazard zone did not reflect the real flood risk. The FEMA maps are off by about three to five feet. Or, um, is there any discussion about expanding the special flood hazard zones to reflect flood risk beyond the 100-year flood event given rainfall and flood events are becoming more intense, frequent, and damaging? So within the National Risk Index, uh, we did our best to leverage FEMA floodplain data where possible to help us understand where we have potential exposures to, to flood has the flood hazard. We also added in frequency data from the National Climatic Data Center, which collects storm data reports for both uh, loss causing and some non loss causing events as reported by each of the weather forecasting office. So we leveraged as much data as possible to um, develop the National Risk Index Riverine Flood product. Um, there are some ongoing efforts at FEMA to help understand more about flood and flood risk. And I'd encourage you to, you know, explore FEMA's website, um, you know, around, you know, risk rating 2.0 and, um, you know, join if you're, if you're able to join any of the ASFPM sessions. I know there's um, going to be some talk there as to about, you know, ways that FEMA is looking at how we can leverage um, more information around the flood hazard um, in general. Um, also, you know, there's a, a lot of different products that are available to users to help understand their, their flood risk. And, you know, it, we really do our best to work in a complementary way to, to really help users understand what are their, uh, what is their flood risk to natural hazard or to their flood risk um, across the country. 
Thank you, Casey. So the next question is from Ben. He said, um, just as many low income and communities of color are skeptical about government messages regarding COVID-19, might there also be skepticism concerning a, a national risk index? And so Ben wanted to know uh, when you were developing this tool, did you bring in uh, socially marginalized or other potentially skeptical groups as co-production partners? That's a, a really good question. Um, we, we brought in a wide variety of experts into the National Risk Index as we were developing it. Uh, we engaged upwards of 80 plus subject matter experts. Um, and a lot of our focus was around um, the development of the hazard data and understanding you know, how we bring all of the data together and how we bring in social vulnerability and community resilience data. And you know, some of the perspectives of our partners really helped us to make sure that in the way we developed the National Risk Index that we were doing our best to include um, different populations that would be impacted by disasters. Um, you know, definitely when we developed the NRI, we developed it under, you know, with the thought of, you know, we want to make sure that we're putting data out to users that they can trust and count on to help understand risk. But to do that, we have to develop a product that is sound. So that's when we worked with the subject matter experts, you know, we went back and we talked to each of them multiple times throughout the process to say, are we capturing the risk for your hazard appropriately? Are we doing our, did we calculate it in a magnitude that matches historic loss data? Um, did we calculate it in a way that matches your professional opinion to be the, the risk for that hazard? Um, so we worked and engaged as much as possible to make sure that we produced a product that not only was sound from mathematically sound, but also matched um, the hazard itself. Um, and then we also are sharing the data in ways that multiple users can access. Um, within, within our full application, it's completely 508 compliant. So um, anyone who has accessibility challenges, um, they have the ability to, and they may not be able to explore the map, uh, but they have the ability to extract data from the National Risk Index through our data extract tool um, that is avail available to all the users. Um, they have the ability to download data in multiple formats, geospatial and non-geospatial and tabular formats, um, to be able to explore data around the National Risk Index to help reduce their risk. And we also are providing it in a, a tribal uh, related layer so that users can then also explore data um, at the, the tribal level as well. Thank you. So Lauren asked, how does the derivative air quality during a fire get factored into the risk analysis as effects may take a while to show? That, that is a really good question, um, again, and it, it relates to a, a few other conversations that we've had within the National Risk Index is, how do we define impacts to a hazard? Um, another example is a volcano uh, may erupt in Alaska. What are the long-term economic impacts? Or an avalanche closes the highway to ski resorts. What are the impacts to the ski resorts? And that is that that data are not very well or not available um, in most cases. So we really try to focus on the hazards themselves. Um, an example of air quality, um, when if the data are not also captured in the historic loss database, then unfortunately it's re really difficult for us to include it. Um, and I was looking today as we were reviewing some data before our, our full application release this summer, and within the Paradise Fire in California, there's um, multiple entries within the NCEI storm data reports, and all, all of the impacts are associated around the fire but there's also an air quality impact and there's no losses around that. So without having that information, it's really difficult for us to bring it into the NRI. But I agree, there's definitely long-term impacts that we're just not able, able to capture and um, that it's just, unfortunately at this time, we just don't have enough data. Thank you. Um, so Sarah, as well as several other people asked sort of a, a similar question to this about, you, you mentioned during your presentation, the social vulnerability working group and that you ultimately landed on, 
obviously using the University of South Carolina's SOV, but several of our participants today just wanted to hear you say a little bit more in particular about why you did choose SOV over, for example, CDC's Social Vulnerability Index, which is a, a fellow federal agency tool. And so could you just share a little bit more about the reasoning behind landing on SOV? So our initial landing on SOV, uh, when, just when we went through the working groups, it was back in 2016, 17, and the CDC index had just, just come out. Um, and it's an additive index versus the, the way SOV is created. Uh, we had a lot of questions about this SVI and you know how it was was brought together. Um, ultimately, we looked back and said, you know, using SOBI, um, it had been around since 2003, and in, in one, if not before, in one fashion or another, it has been routinely tested over time, um, and it had a path towards being updated. And some of those questions weren't clear with SVI. Um, this was our our, our initial review. Um, and as you know, data are updated and methods are updated, we want to take a step back and review those over time. Um, also, the other piece is, is with SOVI, it had BRIC as kind of a complementary index to understand the differences in resilience versus vulnerability. And there is no collinearity between the two um, where that research was already available and we didn't have the same thing for SBI and the other resiliency indices that we ultimately move forward with. Um, you know, and after the 2020 census data are released and the resilient and the indices are updated, we want to do our due diligence in reviewing what's available and making sure that we're incorporating the best product that helps us represent um, risk across the country. Thank you. So Mark asked for, had a question about losses and exposure. And he said, has there been any discussion of replacing costs with services provided to bring more equity into the benefit cost analysis? For example, a residence is a residence, regardless of whether it's a single family home or an apartment, regardless of cost. So we were leveraging data that were really avail available to us and our way to come up with a way of calculating an expected annual loss was around the dollar value. Um, there, there, I'm sure there's other ways out there and, and being able to communicate, um, you know, losses to number of residents, um, losses to fatal in terms of fatalities and in agricultural products, but having the dollar value as a way of bringing all of the data together allows for us to compare real numbers uh, versus having a relative ranking for the expected annual loss. Um, and that's, that was kind of our rationale for coming up with that, um, at least initially. But, you know, we're, we're always happy to explore other ways of, of calculating the expected annual loss. Um, you know, and looking at the, the number of buildings and looking at it from like a ratio type of perspective. So if there's, you know, 50,000 residents in one community and, you know, 10 are, are impacted, what, what is the ratio um, of impacts? Um, so it's, it's definitely something that would be interesting to look at, but ultimately we, we did make the decision to move forward with using the expected annual loss of value. Thank you. So our next question is from David. He wanted to know, is FEMA open to eventually replacing potentially misleading social vulnerability heuristics with economic data? And so he's um, specifically were referring to some work by a team um, out of Stanford that uh, used economic data. So can you sort of talk to us about the using social vulnerability versus economic data and the decisions around that? Yeah, our decision around using social vulnerability is that, you know, it, it, it's more than just economics. It allowed for us to look at all different parts of the community and community makeup, um, you know, and like I said, as we move forward, um, you know, we do want to reevaluate different pieces of the, the National Risk Index. You know, we've, we've had feedback on our tornado methodology that it just we needed to make a few tweaks. So we, we were able to make those updates. And when we release our full application this summer, the results from Tornado um, are, are a lot more robust. 
Um, and we want to do that with all of the other aspects, especially with the 2020 census data release. We know that we um, have to make a large change already in just updating all of the data sets. So this is a good opportunity for us to take a step back and also review how we're building those data sets. Um, so, you know, you know, right now we, we do want to, we are using the SOVI and social vulnerability to define one of the equity components, um, you know, and some of the drivers of, so, of social vulnerability are around, um, around wealth. And that, you know, that's just one of the, one of the factors of social vulnerability. Thank you. So Kevin wanted to know um, how are, are you pulling data from either state or local hazard mitigation plans into the index? So right now we leveraged um, the, just the state mitigation plan as our foundation for understanding where we have difference or which hazards are most important to mitigate. Uh, to the different states. So what is the, the analysis or what's, what hazards are being profiled? Um, and we're working, actively working with the mitigation planning program at FEMA and understanding, you know, if how the NRI is used in the, in the planning process, what uh, elements of the specific planning process it meets, and then, you know, what is their feedback, right? Uh, with the National Risk Index, it gives us a baseline across the country. So we're using the same data sets to define risk, um, you know, and understanding more about, you know, where we have differences in hazard frequency, um, where we have differences in exposure. Um, but what the one thing is that would be interesting is we know states and locals have better data. There's a specific Sorry, am I still on or did I get signed out? I, it just cut out. You said the word specific and it just cut out for sort of 10 seconds. Okay. Am I back? It just, I, something <laughs> popped up. It's signed, you've been signed out. Um, so. Yeah, we can still, we still hear good? you. Thank you. Okay. I, are you guys still, okay. Are you guys still seeing my screen and not a bunch of pop-ups on it? <laughs> just your screen yes thank okay. you thank you um we know that there's a, a lot more local data sets that can be brought in there's a single database in florida but it's only specific for florida we know the hazard doesn't stop at the county boundary or the state boundary um and we want to explore that more there's a robust winter storm database for north carolina but it's only for the state. So it's like, how do we really want to understand more about if we bring the data in, how are we modifying the larger part of the national risk index? And instead of then at that point, we wouldn't really be producing a baseline risk assessment, but we may have better risk assessment data for one location versus another. And uh, we're still working through a lot of the logistics of, of what that looks like. Right. So, and um, Casey, I'm so sorry, but we only have about one minute left. And so in the last minute, will you just re respond to, um, Brittany wanted to know, how do you define community? Are you referring to counties or is this tool useful for individual municipalities within counties some sort of smaller geographic units, for example? So within the National Risk Index, we have some data limitations in the lowest level of geography we're able to produce data equally available across the country as the census tract level. Uh, larger cities can leverage that because of you know, having multiple census tracts. Um, it allows you to see differences across the county and community. Um, same thing with some of the even medium and smaller sized cities where you, know, you have multiple census tracts in a, in a city of 5,000 people. Um, that's not always you know, the best available data um, that taking it to a lower level of geography will actually require us to understand, get have more robust census data to help drive the community resilience and social vulnerability component, as well as some other hazards. The data are only available at the census tract, and earthquake is the example for that. Is you know we only have been expecting a loss data for earthquake at the county level, not at the or sorry at the census tract level, not at the block group or block or zip code level. Okay, so, so there. thanks again, Lori, for inviting us. This was super, super exciting, and I'm happy to answer any questions. 
email us at fema-nri at fema.dhs.gov. Uh, we love hearing feedback and, um, and happy to answer any questions. Yes, Casey, thank you so much. And there are, there are some really incredible questions in the chat and in the Q&A. So again, get, we will get those downloaded, get those over to you and to everybody who joined us today and engaged so fully. Thank you so much. And know that we will get those written responses from Casey. And just thank you so much for um, Casey for the presentation, which was so uh, thought provoking and to the participants for your thoughtful questions. We are so grateful. We're grateful to the NSF and to FEMA for supporting this series and allowing us to bring speakers like you to this, uh, to this series. And so thank you. And just in our last few seconds, I want to remind everybody out there, if you are hoping to receive uh, continuing education credits through IAEM, please visit our website, go to the Making Mitigation Work uh, webpage, and you can get more information there to make sure you get your credit for being here today. And thank you to IAEM for the support. And last but not least, we would like to ask all of you to please mark your calendars for next month's webinar, where we will be joined by four uh, mitigation champions who are going to be talking to us about how to make the case for risk reduction and equitable disaster recovery. And so please join us on Tuesday, June 8th from 1 to 2 p.m. Eastern. And um, please know that we look forward to seeing you next Next month and um, we hope that you please stay healthy, keep doing the great work to reduce disaster risk, and please remember to take care of yourself and others. We will see you again soon. Thank you.